Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Oh Lord, I thank you uh, for each of us here today and just pray that you would um, use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us, to encourage us. Lord, we pray that you keep the rain away, um, but also that you would send a rain uh, from above. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to uh, refresh in us and to uh, draw us ever closer to you. And we ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we are in our continuing our study in 1 John. Now, this is just happens to fall on Mother's Day that I get to teach you about the first mom of the whole world, Eve, because her boys are mentioned in the chapter we're in. Now, I didn't plan that. Only God could, like, see ahead at my snail's pace and time it to where I get to teach you about... Who is, who is Eve's boys? Does anyone know the first two boys? Cain and Abel. That's right, Cain and Abel. And today, we're going to take a look at this passage, what John, John has just declared... See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God. So, and such we are. We're, we are called to be His children. Now, on this Mother's Day, you know, we remember that we have a heavenly Father. And uh, we do honor our moms. We're grateful for them. But this, this chapter brings us into an intimate relationship with God. It doesn't call Him our commander, our boss, our, you know, employer. He's our father, our heavenly father that we saw last week. We get to call out by the spirit of God, Abba in Hebrew, which means daddy. We get to be that close to our heavenly father that we look at him as our dad. Now, we saw last week in verse three uh, that uh, there is a hope we have to look forward to, and that is Seeing the Lord. Now, this is something that the early church, they were, they were kind of started off with this from the very get-go because when Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels told the men of Galilee, why do you stand here gawking? We went over this last week with your mouths unhinged, looking up at the sky. Don't you know? And what did he tell them? Don't you know? Don't you know that the, this Jesus that ha- you have seen depart into heaven and 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 remember that they saw the heavens open and jesus be seated where at the right hand of the father they saw him go and take his place at the right hand of god and so you know i know some people think heaven is really far away but if they saw it physically from earth is it really that far away is heaven so far that we you know i think we're just blinded our perception is we don't see the things what are in the spirit. They can be right around. How many of you ha- have friends or, or, or family members that are very um, sensitive to things of the spiritual realm? They seem to know when someone is troubled or they seem to know when there's like a, a bad spirit in the room. They can, they can discern that. Now, they, I know some people like to say, well, if I can't see it, it's not really there. It's, it's kind of the old put your head in a paper bag and then that means all the danger is gone because you can't, it, it, it's still stick, a, stick your head in the sand like an ostrich. Does that really make danger go away? Just because you stuck your head in the sand? No, all that means is you stuck certain body parts, you know, in the air so that you could be a target. I mean, that doesn't work. You can't just blind yourself and say, I don't see it so it's not there. I don't see God. I, I hear this often. Well, if God is really real, why doesn't he show himself? Why doesn't... And to answer that question, he did. In fact, the, the disciples during Jesus' day, they said, would you just show us the Father and it will suffice? And what was Jesus' answer? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I came to show you the Father. So that they would... Th- that, that's a legit... By the way, if any of your friends ever say that, I wish God would just show himself. Say, that's a really good point you got there. Did you know he already did? See, because the question is, can a God who created everything reveal himself to us? And the answer is, truly, he can. And he's done so in his son, Jesus. Now, Jesus, 
was taken up into heaven. They saw him go up. And the angel said, don't you know that in the like manner in which you saw him go, in like manner, he will return. And we read in Revelation, which we're starting to study with the college and career group on Saturday night, the uh, book of Revelation goes into great detail how the sky will be rent. It'll be pulled back and the Son of Man will come. And I don't think it's going to be like, oh, it's way, way, way in, out in outer space. I think, you guys, we're going to see the sky peel open. And what we thought was so far away, the Bible says every eye will see. Now, those that are waiting in hope, it says that hope will purify our hearts. And that's as far as we got last week, that there is a hope of the Lord's return that truly purifies our hearts from within because we struggle with stuff. And John, John, the, the man that is penning these words, breathed by the Holy Ghost, he was experienced with people. He knew that there were people that struggled with their faith. He knew there were people that struggled with areas of sin. He knew that Jesus came to set them free from that too. And he wanted them to, to be able to discern. So John, remember, I've been telling you, John always writes things like, I write this so that you will know this particular thing. I write this so you will know this other thing. I write this. Well, well he's been writing these points and today we get to see one of the most beautiful points, I think, in the whole of the book. One of the things that we get to know that he, is, that he does for us. Now, verse 4, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 reads, And everyone that practices sin, they also practice lawlessness. For it says lawless, sin is lawlessness. Now you know. What do you know? I hope verse 5, all of you know verse 5. You know that Christ appeared to do what? To take away sins. And in him, how much sin is in Christ? None. There's no sin in him. In fact, that was a requirement of the law that there would be a perfect lamb to shed its blood for the sacrifice of sin. It had to be a perfect lamb. Ble no blemish. Spotless. And that's what Christ came to be for us. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that does what? Covers the sins of the world, right? No, he didn't say covers. What did he say? Takes away. He came to take away our sin. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I hear this message, and I, I mean, I've heard the message of Christ taking away my sin for a few years now. I never get tired of the idea that he takes away. How many sins? All of them. I mean, does anyone here besides me get excited about the idea that he takes away all? all of your sin he, he doesn't just go well i'll forgive it but i'm never going to forget does he do that by the way i forgive but I no he doesn't in fact the the psalmist says he casts our sin into the sea of forgetfulness never to be remembered again i love what jesus does for people because he takes away their sin and he takes the you know sometimes if, if we blow it sometimes we we can be really hard on ourselves even if, you know, we ask God to forgive us, or maybe we sinned against somebody, we ask them to forgive us. We're all, you know, forgive me. And they're going, okay, don't worry about it, brother. It's fine. No, we all blow it, you know. And they, and they let it go. But you know what? Sometimes we're the worst, the worst with ourselves. We keep kicking ourselves. Man, I can't believe I did that. And, and we condemn ourselves. And today, in this chapter, there is a verse that says what God has to say about that. When it comes to our hearts condemning us, some of you might already know verse 20 of this chapter. If you want to sneak a peek, you can see what it says. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts, right? Does he condemn you for your sin? Now, now why did Jesus come to take away our sin? How much condemnation, according to Romans 12, it says in uh, verse 1, how much condemnation is there for someone who believes in Christ Jesus? How much? Just a little, right? No, none. There is no condemnation for you when you're in Christ Jesus. None. Christ didn't come to condemn you. Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Why don't the preachers preach that? Is that a good message to learn? Christ came to save us from our sin. He came to free us. The Bible says, who the Son has set free is free what? Indeed, when Christ frees you from your sin, 
you are really free. I mean, it's talk about freedom. You're, when he takes away your sin, it's done. It's go- and this is really important because I see so many folks struggling and in their lives, they're, they're, they're like stuck, paralyzed. Something they did or something that happened, they, they, they struggle with, they can't let go. Do you know anyone that's like, I call them frozen because of, um, I don't know, it's like a paralysis. They can't, they can't move forward in life because something is holding them back. And though we don't, you know, quantify it in the physical realm, can fear keep you from moving forward? Can guilt about something that you've, that you, you blew it in some area. There, there are some guys that they are stuck because they have guilt of some shameful thing they did and, and they can't seem to, to move forward. They're just, the, and the, by the way, the devil loves to wave it over you. If you blow it, God doesn't condemn you, but he does. And that jerk, I, mean, I can call him a jerk, okay, it's allowed. I can call him a lot of other nasty names too because he's deserved them. But he has, a, he has a moniker that the Bible tells us that Lucifer wears. It's called the, 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 the father of all what? Lies. He's a liar. And a liar doesn't care whether there's a truth or not. A liar will just make up stuff to make you feel bad. Well, that, that rascal, the Bible tells us in Revelation that he stands before God day and night and he accuses the brethren. And he's up there going, did you see what is he did? And it, you, you blow it in the littlest way. He's, he's like, aha, point the finger, gotcha. You know, because he's the condemner, not Jesus. Somebody needs to teach it like it says in the book. Christ came to set you free from your sin, not to condemn you. Now, how do you know whether someone is walking upright or not? I'm sure John had to deal with this, you know, being a pastor in the early church. I, I already know I get my fair share of these questions, so... I love the next part of John chapter 3 here, 1 John chapter 3, because John basically puts it in what I call simple layman's terms. Like, how do I know if someone's really walking uprightly? Or, or, or they're really below, you know, that they have faith. How do I know? Jesus said, you know by the fruit, right? You shall know them by their fruits. He was talking about fruits of the Spirit, the disciplines that God's Spirit gives us. Listen to this. Now you know, verse 5, he appeared to take away sins. In him there is no sin. And no one who abides in him, that means remains in Jesus, no one who remains in Jesus sins. It says no one who sins has, it, it, it says, has seen him or knows him. The little children, he says, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the one who practices sin, he says, he's of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And no one who's born of God practices sin. Now this is the practicing of sin. That doesn't mean anyone born of God, does that mean that you never sin? No. I mean, we we still slip up. There's a difference between slipping up and intentionally continuing to sin in fact in the book of hebrews it says will there be a sacrifice it's asked in a rhetorical form in hebrew is there really a sacrifice if i keep continuing to sin willfully like should i continue to sin what's romans 6 tell us shall we continue to sin that grace might abound what's the answer may it never be god forbid don't ever persist to continue practicing sin because just to say, well, it's okay. It'll just show off how much extra grace God has for forgiving me. He says, the one who practices sin is of, not our heavenly father, of, the, of that, that demonic father, the devil. He's of the devil. And Christ has, it says, the son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now, no one who's born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. By this, he says, the children of the devil and the children of God, they're obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And nor the one who does not love. This is a clue. How do I know if someone really is of God? 
If he doesn't practice his righteousness, it says, and if he doesn't love his what? You see that at the end of verse 10? If he does not love his brother. You know, if you say, I love God, but you don't love your brother. What did Jesus have to say about that? Is that really doable with God's economy? Does he like us to say, yes, I love God, but I hate that guy. Are we, as Christians, we're supposed to do that? Is that what Christ did? No. God so loved the world, he gave his son for all of us. And we don't get to say, I love God, but I hate my brother. In fact, you've got to forgive your brother. And, and, and I saw on Facebook, someone sent me a post where, where they said, Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive? Up to seven? And then, and then and you don't know the answer, right? Jesus said, not seven, up to seven times what? Seventy. And they, and they went, I don't know which is harder, the spiritual truth or the math. <laughs> it was posted by one of the gals saying that she didn't like math. Seven times 70, 490 times. And by the way, is that 490 times in their lifetime? That's a day. So if you really want to do some fun math, figure how many hours of the day are they awake to sin against you? Maybe, what, 12? If they, if they, they go a long day, 14 hours, right? Divide that into 490 and figure out how many times it works out to where it's, it's more than one a minute of daylight wake time to sin against your brother. He's like this. Hey, brother. Smack. Sorry, sin against you. Forgive me. Okay, ready? Smack. <laughs> just, just keep going and keep going and keep going. And We think that it's very hard for us to fathom that kind of forgiveness that would just continue all day long. To, but Jesus is making a point. How much do we need to forgive? I'm preparing my message. In between, I'm scan scanning Facebook from some, someone said, I'm just trying to send you a message. I'm looking for it. And I get another post, and it was a, it was a testimony of a Muslim. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a man who was captured by the Muslims, held hostage. Did anyone see that? A and he, what was his name? His Down Brown. He, he, was, he was with a YWAM. It was on the YWAM's post. And, and he was captured, and he was beaten each day. And so during his imprisonment there, um, he began to pray, and God said to him, you have to love your enemies. You know, it's easy to love your friends, but not so easy to love your enemies, especially the guy that was interrogating him and beating him every day. And so he prayed, and the Lord said, I want you to love this man that's, that's interrogating you. So the guy came in to beat him the next day, and he said, look, sir, if we're going to be, um, you're going to be beating on me every day, could I at least know your name? You know, we should know each other's names. And the guy said, what? He said, well, I figure we, we should be friends. I mean, you're going to have to hit on me every day. You might as well, you know, we might as well get to know each other and, and be fr and, and that is sounds just, uh, does that sound kooky to you to say to, the, to your captor who's beating you? We should at least be friends and, you know, and I'm praying for you, you know. And, and the guy, he, it, it, something snapped in him. He, he told him his name, and he goes, well, we're not supposed to tell you our name. You know, this is a, a first-name basis kind of thing we do here. And so, well, you're beating on me. We should at least know. He says, my name is, and he tells him his name, and, and they exchanged names. And, and he says, and they became friends, and he actually led him to Christ. And you go, wow. That's, you know, it's easy to love the people that are lovely, but to love your enemy. To, to pray for those, it says, that persecute you. He, he's a living today. This is, by the way, this did not go on 100 years back or 1,000 years back. This went on. This, this just happened. He just got released. It's not like new news. Hey, just do we have Christians being persecuted for the gospel today? We have such freedom, guys, to sit on a beach in Hawaii and talk about the Lord. Because in some countries, this is illegal. You'd be arrested. You'd be beaten for just sitting here. You'd have your, your, your hands cut just for opening this book. I saw a dreadful post of a Christian that had their hand just sliced open. Just cut, 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 cut for opening their Bible. 
in the Middle East. There are people that hate the message of this book. But how do I know which ones know God? Well, it says here, the ones that practice righteousness and love their what? Their brother. If they don't love their brother, they don't practice righteousness. You tell me, how hard is that one to figure out? Do they follow God? No. And John knew there's people that are going to ask this question. How do I know if someone follows God? Well, look, if they love their brother and they do what's righteous, righteous means right in God's sight. Okay, not Righteous doesn't mean right in, in a social, moral kind of sense. Righteous means what would be right to do before God. If a man does what's right before God and loves his brother, you got your answer. Is he, is he, does he know the Lord? Yeah. It's really simple. And if he doesn't do those things, if he walks in unrighteousness, he practices sin, then he's not really, he's not doing the things that indicate he is born of God. Now, this is the message, verse 11 says, which we have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. This message is not new. And in, interesting, here's my Mother's Day twist for you. Get to throw this in. Not it says, as Cain did, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? It says, because his deeds were evil and his brother's deeds were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, then if the world hates you. Now, the deeds of Cain versus the deeds of Abel. Do you guys know the story in Genesis about Cain and Abel? What, what deeds did they do that were, one was, one was seen as right in God's sight. One of the boys did what was right. That was Abel. And I, I know a little Hebrew, so it kind of makes it easier for me be, to remember who's who in the story. And it helps my brain remember what they did that was right because Habel in, he, in Hebrew, ha, is, uh, they don't say Abel. A -A Abel is an American translation for you. That's speaking American. But in Hebrew, Abel's name is pronounced Habel. Ha is breath. Or, you know, in, in Aloha in Hawaii, we say it's the, that ha, the breath of life. And ha, the breath, bel is house. So the breath that is in a in a house but but in the sense in the jewish culture when you say habel it's um it's like in a meadow when there's that breath that that light breeze that blows over a meadow and the and the and just ever so lightly you see the the swaying of the anyone seen this in a meadow where the all the grass just moves gently with waves just wafting back and forth that that is what they call the breath of god in his house, Habel, the house of, of life, that breath, his breath blowing. And so it means a, a, a meadow in Hebrew. That place is a, anyone been to a meadow and just felt like this is so peaceful? If you, has anyone ever laid out in the meadow in the grass and just, you could hear the sound of the wind just, just gently passing over the, the, the reeds, bending them. And that, there's something just special about that. Well, that's what Abel or Habel, his name meant meadow. His brother, Cain in, in Hebrew, or Cain, we say in English, is means um, one that I got given to me, one that, the gotten one. And this is, by the way, Eve, Adam and Eve's firstborn. So for her, when she had her firstborn son, she said, I have gotten one. I have received, and in would be, signifying the masculine in other words god has given to me a boy my gotten boy okay and so it's a it's like the gift you know how'd you like to walk around what's your name um a gift from god you know given to my mom on mother's day <laughs> it was her first mother's day yeah i'm the gift that was what cain meant now Turn with me to Genesis, if you don't mind, real quick. I want to show you that, that they had, one was doing what was right in God's sight, and the other was not. And this is, this story, it, it's interesting because 
This is, the, this is the reference that John uses to say, love your brother not like Cain did to Abel. Okay, so sometimes the best way to explain what not to do is look at somebody who did the wrong thing and say, don't do that. Because <clears throat> this is the story of don't do this. Okay, in all sincerity, do not do this. In fact, learn from this story. We find this written for us, recorded in Genesis chapter 4. It starts off, it says, now, when the man had relations with his wife Eve, that's Adam, you guys know, it says she conceived, gave birth to Cain, and she named him, uh, she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord, like my gift from God. So she named him Cain. Now again, she gave birth to, to his brother, Habel, or Abel, and he was the keeper of the flocks. Now where do you put flocks? In the meadow, Right? So this I'm going to help you remember which what, what they did. The the meadow is where you put the the sh you bring the sheep to the meadow and they had the little the little um, nice water there you could bring them to graze and to, to take a drink. But Cain it says the gotten one was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer, like Dad. Remember Adam was put in the garden, and his job was to do what? Be the keeper of the garden. Now by the way they've been kicked out of the garden. Remember because of sin so they're outside the garden but but Cain is following Adam's example he's he's tilling the ground he's working the ground so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord and his offering was from the fruit of the ground okay he brought you know stuff that had grown from the ground to God Habel Abel on his part it says he also brought an offering but his offering was the firstlings of his flock and he set their fat portions before the Lord. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offerings, he had no regard. Now you say, well, why did God want this specific offering of the, of the, of the flock? Remember what it says in Hebrews. Every scripture, it testifies of who? Who is written of in the volume of the book? Who's the main? Jesus. From the very beginning, the very first story of the first acceptable offering given to God. Did God want the fruit of the ground? No. Why do you think from the beginning he wanted to set up this precedent that there was going to have to be an offering from the flock? Well, well, it's, all a, right? it's all a foreshadow of who? Jesus, the Lamb of God, what will take away the sins of... This is from the beginning. God said, this is what I require. You want to give me an offering? Bring it from the flock. Bring me from the Lamb. Not from, not from the fruit of the ground. That's not the acceptable offering for sin. Well, Abel brought the firstlings of the flock to the Lord. And Cain brought his little basket of fruit. I don't know if it's a basket. I'm just surmising. Somehow he carried the fruit over to the Lord. And he goes to give it to the Lord. And the Lord says, um, I don't want that offering, Cain. And Cain, it says, became very angry. And his countenance fell. Now this is really important here, guys. Because it says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Countenance, that that intangible quality. I've been teaching the young men about this to look for women that have a godly countenance. You know, the, what a, I was trying to teach them. It's the full package deal, you know. You know, they, they always look at the outside good looks, you know, but they forget the whole, there's, you know, the whole package here. Where, and, and countenance is that, that intangible quality that, that just, you guys know people that, that they just have a glow to them. There's a there's something a light a, a brightness about them their their being just that just shines and by the way, I believe all of us as Christians should have that light of the Lord shining through us. We're we're supposed to be like His light, burning as a lamp inside us. We're 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 the we're just a lantern to carry His light to the world. Now if you're if you're persisting in sin, you you know the old style lanterns where they had the glass on the outside and. What happens if you get too much soot on the glass? You can have a real bright flame inside, but 
but you don't light the light doesn't get out because it's all sooty. And the Lord, when He comes into our lives, He goes, "Let me clean your glass." You know, squeegee that thing, you know. And He comes and He takes all our spots, all of our stains, all of our smudges, all our sin, and He washes us clean. Now He puts His light inside of us, and guess what? All well, some people are going, "Wow, you got a glow to you. You really should." And just quick show of hands. Anyone ever had someone do that to you? They go, you, there's something about you. You have this glow or you have this, there's a light or there's a, 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 a lately it's, the, it's an aura, okay? I, I'll tell you because a lot of the new agers are, are seem to be passing around, you know, checking out the different religious things and they come to me and they're like, you have an aura, a golden aura. Golden. I'm like, <laughs> it's the Lord. And, and to them, I, by the way, I don't knock. I, I think we were designed to be able to perceive that, but a lot of people have dulled themselves to that. They have gotten so busy looking at just physical things that they forgot those intangible qualities of the of the spirit that are within people that shine out of people that radiate. But some of you are very in tune with that. You you spot it right away. You have that sensitivity. Well, these these young men. Cain, when he, when he was offering the wrong offering, God said, I don't, I don't accept that offering. I don't have no regard for that. What happened to Cain's countenance? It went down, right? And he was no longer, you know, that happy-go-lucky firstborn, I'm the gotten child of, you know, my mama, I'm the gift. Firstborn, I'm the awesomest. Mr. Awesomeness has all of a sudden got Mr. Cranky Pants. <laughs> and he's just like, rah, 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 and God doesn't like what I gave him. Man, man, man. And you know what the Lord said to him in that state? He said, listen, Cain, if you do what is right, just do what, if you do well, he says, will not your countenance be lifted up? You know, sometimes people are cranky because they're doing wrong. And they need someone to come along and say, stop that. Just do what's right. You'll feel so much better about yourself. Have you ever been stuck doing something wrong and you, you inside already know, I don't feel good about this. And you keep doing it and you feel even worse. And pretty soon without realizing, you've turned into cranky pants. And everyone's just looking at you like, what's your problem, man? I don't got no problem. Yeah, you do. Your countenance has fallen. And if you want your countenance to be lifted up, all you have to do is what? Start doing what's right. It's amazing the change I see in people when I just give them this little encouragement. This Bible calls it an exhortation. Exhortation means encourage you to do what's right. I'm going to just encourage you, stop doing what's wrong and do what's right. Watch what happens to you. Will it change you? Will it change your countenance at all? Sure it will. People can see it. They, they're like, wow, that person just glows. Because when you start doing right, by the way, how do you feel about yourself when you do that? Yeah, it's like, this is working. Because we are designed to do what's right in the sight of the Lord. We're designed to love one another. I mean, God made us that we would love one He made us to where we need love. His love. But we don't just need His love to come to us, but we need His love to flow through us to others. Because there's something that brings a life to our spirit when His love is part of our lives and when we walk in that not like Cain did Cain Cain his countenance has fallen he's cranky pants and what's he do well you guys know now listen to the words of the Lord this is God speaking to him he says verse 7 if you do well will not your countenance be lifted up but if you do not do well what will happen he said sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you. And he says, but you must master it. Has anyone ever felt like sin is crouching at your door? Where it's just, you know, it's right there, the temptation, right? And I, I don't know about you, but I'm really glad this is in the Bible. This is like, we're only into chapter four of Genesis here. We're like in the very beginning book. And we already see the struggle of doing what's right or falling into that thing that is crouching at the door 
to do what's wrong. Now, you guys read the story, right? What's Cain wind up doing? Does he do well? Does he go get a, his brother and say, hey, Bell, I know you're my little brother, but could I get a lamb too? I need to give what God asks. No. He could have, right? You know, older brothers, they don't like to ask younger brothers for anything. I know that. I'm the oldest. We hate getting hand-me-ups. Not hand-me-downs, you know. We give down to them, but we don't want them giving back. He would have had to go get a hand-me-up. Can I get one of your, uh, yeah, your flock so I can give God what he asks? He didn't want to do it. Instead, what did he do in the Bible? What did Cain do to Abel? His countenance fell, and Cain told Abel his brother. Yeah, God told me do what's right. Just, you know. Don't give him what I want to give him. Give him what he wants. By the way, is that a good spiritual lesson? Am I supposed to give God what I want to give him? Or am I supposed to give him what he requires? How many of you guys know there's a verse in the Bible that says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of us? Does anyone know that verse, Micah? Chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. Are you, you said, I saw your lips saying it. To do justice, to love what? Mercy, and to walk what? Humbly with thy God. That's God's already shown man what, what he requires. Do what is just, justice, just in his sight. Love mercy, and walk humbly. That's what he's shown us to do. Now, did Cain want to do it? It says he went and talked to his brother. Yeah, I know, I'm supposed to do this. But it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. And the Lord then came and said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? By the way, do you think God didn't know where Abel was? I always, you know, some people are like, oh, I think God was stupid. He didn't, he lost Abel. If he's God, doesn't he know where? I'm saying, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Being a teacher and all that I am, how many times does a teacher ask questions while he's giving his lesson? Why do we ask questions when we're teaching? Because we want to find out the answer? Hopefully we know the answer. It is one of the strongest forms of teaching to bring a point to the, from the, maybe perhaps in the back of the conscience, to the front of the conscious mind by asking a question where you have to retrieve the answer you get the answer brought right into the perspective it needs to be brought. Where is, can you just see this God asking Cain after he's killed his brother? Where's your brother? You guys are going to love this answer. Does anyone know? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh my gosh, this is the oldest line ever. When somebody sins, how many times have they come up with, well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keep? Do I have to keep track of them? You do when you kill them. Now, God knew where he was. But he's trying to get Cain to make a confession of his sin. Then the Lord said to him, What, what have you done? He's giving him a chance to come clean. He said, The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, if you're God, can you hear the voice of the blood crying from? You're God. Sure. You hear anything. Stuff we don't even understand, I believe. God already far, his understanding is so far beyond ours. You know, I mean, if, if you can't receive this, just pretend like you're on NCIS and Ducky comes in and waves his little wand and yeah, there's some blood splattered there. And then over, and they must have been drug over here, and the nose was over there snapping pictures. And if we can figure out through forensic science just that the pattern of some crime that took place as someone was slain, do you think God couldn't be beyond our understanding and say, His blood is crying to me? The voice of your brother is crying from his blood right there on the ground. And he said, he said, now you are cursed from the ground. That which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, remember he was the cultivator, the tiller of the soil. 
No longer will it yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. He said, behold, you've driven me away this day from the face of the ground. And, and, and from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. I really love this story. By the way, <clears throat> how many folks we have wandering on the planet right now? At this point in the, in the, in the whole progression. Adam, then Eve, they had a boy, Cain, and a brother, Abel. And this brother, Cain, after doing what is wrong, he sinned. He killed his brother. One thing I find really interesting is paranoia sets in when you do wrong. He's paranoid that someone's going to find him and harm him. But who says there's anyone else on the planet yet? You know, by the way, paranoia does not need rational thinking. Because when you do what's wrong, you can be afraid. The Bible says that when you do what is wrong, that, that the, the unrighteous, it says they flee when no one's pursuing them. They just have guilty conscience. Got to dig out. I know because I used to run with a few savory characters. And it was amazing how when a cop car went by, whoo, duck. You know, swing that way. We're going to go that way now. You know, I mean, it, he didn't have his lights on. He wasn't chasing us. But when you're doing what's not right, you flee. Because you have a guilty conscience. He is starting to get the guilt. Oh, no. I'm going to be, I mean, someone's going to kill me, whoever finds me, and I'm going to be hidden from your face and hidden from the ground. I da, 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 da. You know, all he would have had to done is gone and asked his brother, been humble, and said, I need one of your flock. Here, I'll give you the fruit. I got to give God what he asked. But he didn't do it. And he goes down as the example now, what we see in 1 John, as when John says, we need to love our brother, not like Cain, who didn't love his brother, Right? Cain didn't love it. He would have loved his brother. He wouldn't have killed his brother over this. He would have just asked for a lamb so he could have made a right offering. But there was a heart condition in Cain. I suspect he had pride. Older brother pride. I'm too proud to ask my little brother for something. I don't want to go there. Whatever his problem was, he just didn't want to do what's right. It's a sad thing that our our whole being gets changed when we adopt his attitude. Where we become stubborn and prideful. And I, you know, I know God wants me to go take care and help that person, but I don't want to do it. You're like, why? Well, I'd have to humble myself and put them first. Did Jesus humble himself and put us first? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Turn with, back with me to 1 John chapter 3. Let's see how he ties us in. He says, now guys, verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love abides in death. You want to know if someone's really, up now abide means remains. If you remain in life, you will remain in the love of God. And God's love will remain in you. You will have God's love Guys, I don't want to tell you, God's love has radically changed me. I know, because I didn't have his love. And this part, what speaks about the one who has hate, that was me. When my mom married and divorced five times, by the way, that didn't happen overnight. That took a few years. Not that many, but enough to make me pretty scarred. I did not have love. I got to where I just hated. I hated every time another guy came to the, to our door. You know, I'm here to take your mother out on a date. I just wanted to get my shotgun and greet these fellows, you know, with a, with a, with a permanent do not pass go, do not collect $200. You're not getting, you know, through the threshold of this house. And I, a hate grew in my heart. And this part about 
He who hates his brother is a murderer. What did Jesus say? If you look on your brother with, with hate in your heart, you, or you look on him and you say in Hebrew, raka, which means empty-headed. Fool. You fool. Not that we would ever say we called our brother a fool. Right? Slight show of pinkies. Anyone ever thought it? Had a friend or family member? Fool. Jesus said, if you have thought this, what is it like? Like you have murdered them. If you look on a woman with lust in your heart, Jesus said, it's like you've committed adultery. I mean, this is, this is serious stuff. He's looking at the intent of the heart here. And he says, we know we have passed out of death and into life. How do we know? It says, because of what? Love. One thing I can tell you that has changed in me is God had to put his love into my heart. And I know he did. I know he radically changed me from hating and wanting to kill some folks to actually caring enough about them that I wanted them to come to know Christ. He changed my heart to where that person, instead of me just wishing they'd fall off the earth and perish, I was like, Lord, I just wish you'd save them. Because they could be a whole better version. And you know, some of them fellas might have turned out okay for my mom if they would have just got right with God. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes when, 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 when we're lonely, we'll compromise. Because there's that relationship, at least, I, I call it the relationship of convenience. It has appeared. It's that neighbor next door. It just happens to be there. It's convenient, you know. And, and our, f our faith sometimes is weak. I know my mom struggled with it. Unfortunately, on Mother's Day, her son didn't want to forgive her. I know, I was the son. And every message I ever heard about forgiving, you got to forgive, you got to forgive. I was like, I have already forgiven all my enemies. All my frenemies, all my friends who became enemies, I forgave all of those guys. And then God said, how about the stepdaughter or, or stepdad one or stepsister or stepbrother or stepdad two or three or four? Forgive that guy? No, he was a jerk. <laughs> five, number five, didn't know him too well. Tried to get away as fast as I could. You forgive them? I guess. How about your mother? You know, I heard all these sermons about forgiveness. Every time the preacher was preaching, you have to forgive. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven, right? Every time I could go through the whole list, I've already forgave them all. And then he had to always touch on that. You know, honor your father and your mother. And make sure you don't have any unforgiveness towards them. I'm like, ah. Oh, man, would you get off of my thumb? You're like stepping on it. You know, like, is it like, like having an elephant back up on my toe. Like, why are you standing on my toe on this subject? And you know, the problem is when God's got you, he's got you. It's like every sermon I heard, forgiveness. Oh gosh, I gotta forgive her too. Why, why do sons have such high bars that they set for their moms? You ever thought about that? Do, by the way, men, do we do that? Boys, do we? Mom is the one. She's like, she's mom. She's like on a pedestal. She's perfect, right? And if she doesn't behave perfectly perfect, we shoot them down. Especially when we don't have love in our heart. I know. And on Mother's Day, there's no better message for me to tell you than that God started wrangling on me and going, so, you forgave everybody except one person. Now, what if I forgave everybody but one person? And then I go to God. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who have trespassed against us. The loaded prayer of all prayers. What did you just pray? God, forgive me all my sins, 
as I don't forgive my mom. And God goes, what? You just prayed, don't forgive me. Because if you don't forgive, what does it go on to say in Matthew 6? I believe it's about verse 17. Jesus said, for if you do not forgive men whom you see, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you. This is not optional forgiveness. By the way, if you, don't, if you walk around with unforgiveness, I got news for you. Your countenance is already sucking mud. You don't have the light shining through you because you just got sucked into a prune. <laughs> You're like, what's your problem? Nothing, man. I just don't forgive. That is a problem. If you don't forgive, the Bible teaches you will not be forgiven. You will not. Really important. On Mother's Day, should I teach people to forgive even their moms? On Mother's Day, would that be a good Mother's Day message? That you must forgive even if, like in my case, this was the last hardest holdout of my heart. The area where God had to really work me over and say, look, you're so quick to forgive everyone else, but you won't forgive your own mother. And you're asking me to forgive you, but you're not forgiving her, so I'm not forgiving you. I hate that message. <laughs> Is it scriptural? Yeah. Finally, God went, are you going to let this go? You know, she is just a person. You're so gracious with the other sinners, but not with a little teeny. And I, I mean, I could be gracious to somebody else's mom who had married and divorced and, and, and led, a, led a, you know, kind of, well, you know, bad lifestyle and everything. And I'd be fine with that. Oh, God, forgive them. Let them in the club. But my own mother... God's like, you got to forgive her. She's in the club too. In fact, my mom was one of the ones influential in me coming to Christ. Because she saw her sin for what it was. And she called out to the Lord, forgive me my sin. And when you do that, does God forgive? Sure. He forgave her, no problem. It was me that wasn't forgiving. So he started working a little more on me. And a little more. you got to let this go. Because if you don't, you're not going to be free. And this holds us back so much from the things what God wants to do in our lives. Just a little, a little thing, like a little area of the heart where we hold on to some sin. Maybe we have some favorite, we don't call it our favorite pet sin, but it is. Like that one thing that we just don't want to let go of. And the problem is, is that that sin is going to bring what in your life? Death. It, the wages of sin is always death. We see the wages of the sin of Cain brought death to his brother. It did bring punishment to Cain for this. But you know what? Everyone that hates his brother, verse 15 says in 1 John 3, he is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for one another, for the brethren. Whoever sees the world's, uh, I'm sorry, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Do you think if you have the ability to help someone, you have the goods to go help that person in need and you go, I ain't helping them. Does that really show the love of God? He says, and little children, let us not love with word nor with tongue, but let us love with deed and truth. Deed, action. Actions and truth speak louder than all the word and tongue. I love you, I love you, I love you. Living it. Living it out. He says, and we know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our hearts before him. And in whatever our hearts condemn us, oh, by the way, after you get done forgiving everyone else, of all the things that you can think of that everyone has done against you, hopefully whenever you hear a preacher preaching on unforgiveness, you go, I already settled all those things. Let it go. 
I've let it all go. But here's the last one. Did you let this one go? And in whatever your heart condemns who? You. The last holdout sometimes for believers is they got to let go of the, of the unforgiveness they hold against themselves. And by the way, God covered this one for you. You don't get to count this one. You don't get to go, well, I'm not forgiving myself, so he can't forgive me. Wrong. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. He already forgave you. In fact, even when you don't forgive you and your heart condemns you, what does the Bible say? God is greater than your heart. He just trumped you. You're going, I can't forgive myself for blowing it in this area. And God goes, too bad, I did. And I, I played my trump card, and it, 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 it won the hand. <laughs> your, your unforgiveness to yourself doesn't count. I already overrode, I won. I don't know about you. Does anyone think this is a good part to end on? That God's love, even when we condemn ourselves, he goes, I don't condemn you. How much condemnation was there for those in Christ? None. And guys, you know, anyone who abides in him, it says, doesn't even sin. Now, that's a tricky one. I, I might come back to that next week to start off because that, that poses a lot of questions, especially in the young believers. They're like, I don't get it. You mean we can, like, not sin? <laughs> I say, I know it's a new concept. I, I, I had to let my head wrap around it a little. I, I used to wake up and not go, I wonder if I'll sin today. I've told you this before. I'd wake up and be thinking, which sins am I going to commit? How many? How often? You know, I like plan out my day. I'm going to go get revenge on this guy. I'm going to go get that. I'm going to do this. And I mean, I was plotting my sin right from the... I hadn't even put my feet to the floor. The brain's already going. Not that any of you would confess this. See, this is my job. I have to get in front of you and be the fool just to bring out the truth. Because when you live in that, that that's not healthy. And, and, and when you come into the light, the light of the Lord, and you have him come into you, you know, Jesus just said, I stand at the door and I knock, and if anyone opens the door of his heart, what does he do? He comes in. And he sups with you. That's the word for, he, he takes of a meal with you. You know, it's a intimate, like having a meal together. He says, I'll be with you. I, and he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. I'll be that one that stays with you. Now, I know I, I finally hearken to that knock and I open the door and I let Christ into my heart. And in so doing, he goes, we got a lot of areas that need work here. We're going to have to let go of some unforgiveness over here. Let that go. I'm going to have to fill you with my love instead of that hate. By the way, love cancels out hate in a great way. You just got to let the love of God come into your heart and he can wash away all that hate. And he washed away that hate in my life and he changed me. And, and from within, all of a sudden, life started to spring from inside. I knew this wasn't me. There's got to be, this is greater than me. This is God being greater than even our hearts. That he can free us from condemnation. From, from even our self-condemnation. Which, by the way, I think we're probably better at that than we like to admit. So, some of you are pros. You've been condemning yourself so long that you got it down to an art form. We could, like, you know, give you a trophy. Professional self-condemner. But I got a verse for you. 1 John 3.20 says, even if your heart condemns you, who's greater than your heart? God. Let it go. He doesn't condemn you. So you don't get to. You, you can, and, and by the way, that's very freeing when you let it sink in. When you finally let it sink in that God, even though I blew it and I know it, and even if no one else knows it, I still kick myself for it. And God goes, I forgive. Let it go. Do we need to let go so we can go forward? Yeah. Remember what the scripture declares. Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. The old things have what? Passed away. He makes in us new creatures, new creations. And don't, don't let the devil try to pin you in the past. You can't go forward. You can't receive what God has for you because you'll just be like held back. 
And some of you are holding yourself back. You're holding on to unforgiveness. You're doing some sin that is wrong, and you're, and you're practicing it, and it's not good for you. And your countenance is in the toilet. And we other Christians know this because we're around you and we can see. You know, when someone's not doing right, it, it just comes out of them. Like stinky. Not right. And I get to tell you, don't. Let it go. God gave the same word to Cain. Did Cain listen? Why don't you just do what's right and you'll do, you'll be fine. Right? Your countenance will be what? Lifted. If your countenance sucks, it's because you are doing wrong. You want to have your countenance lifted? Start doing what's right. Isn't this a really simple preaching? I mean, that's what it comes down to. The one who does righteousness is righteous. The one who practices sin is of his father. And who's the father referring to this father? The devil. Do what's right this week. And let God lift your countenance. Let him bring that life back into you. And if you're holding on forgiveness, if you can hear this, it's eating you up, not them. You know, unforgiveness keep you from moving forward. And it's you that God, God's concerned about. He wants you to let go of it so you can move on and not be trapped. And if you know anyone that they wrestle with this, have them look on the website and, and go check it out. You know, we have a link to the YouTube and the Facebook, and it has the, the message will get posted there in a little while. And, and you can tell someone. Maybe you know someone who really wrestles with this. They, they condemn themselves or they, they have unforgiveness. Just tell them. Go listen to this preacher. It's a real simple study. From First John. And there's a real strong word. For, right from the very first two boys. Gosh. Can you imagine that? Two brothers fighting. Not getting along. All because one wants to do what's right. And the other one doesn't. We never have that do we? No. Being the oldest of four boys. Never. Like every day. Yes we do this. Okay. Let's do what's right. Let's abide in Christ. And next week, I'll start with this, this abiding thing. It has a really sweet savor to it for our spiritual walk. And I think you'll really appreciate it as it goes on to the rest of the things John's... Ju he's just about to introduce us to some of the most freeing things for our faith coming up. If you want, read ahead and, uh, and, and spend some time just mulling it over. See if you, you know, I always like to say, see if you can figure out what I'm going to share next week before I get there. Because, you know, God could show you too. He might even show you more. Then you can tell me. Then I'll have extra. I can share. But God is a God that wants to reveal things to us to help us grow. So let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this example, Lord, that, well, I don't like that Cain killed his brother, but I do like that you gave him a chance to do what was right. And you give to each man that same chance. I pray if there be anyone here listening or what would be listening later on the radio or the internet, that they would take to heart these words and that they would be willing to do what is right in your sight. That they would turn to you and turn away from the things of sin that are holding them back. Turn away from unforgiveness, Lord. Help them just to let it go. As Lord, you had to work in me to let it go. And I want to thank you, Lord, for that freedom that you've brought in my heart. Because when you set us free, Lord, oh, indeed, we are free. So thank you for that freedom from those things. And I, I just bless you. I pray for all the moms, Lord. Blessings be upon them on this Mother's Day. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agreed with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of... Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.